a very good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this seventh edition of the together for education webinar brought to you by notebook we hope all of you and your loved ones are keeping safe and staying at home this is part of a weekly series of webinars for educators school owners administrators teachers and parents that notebook is arranging we thank you for the overwhelming support that we have received for the ones so far and we know we can count on your support in the weeks to come every week we will bring to you eminent panelists discussing problems that you face in your roles as educators i am your host for today shubhayu roy i am also the co-founder of notebook the topic of today's webinar is chasing your dreams at this moment where students are homebound schools are shut there's a massive problem in keeping students motivated but working with a student goes beyond only motivation students are also powerhouse of dreams they are filled with great ambitions and ideas and it is the job of a teacher to nurture those today when the teacher does not have face time with the students it is a huge problem ensuring that students stay put on their paths to chasing their dreams today we have a stellar panel lined up for you who would try to discuss how those dreams can be nurtured even when the world is battling this pandemic before we move on to our speakers a couple of things to note please i can see a lot of you already raising your hands i'm sure you have questions given the stellar panel that we have in front of you however it would really help us if you could use the q and a button at the bottom of your screen and type in your questions so that we can take them all at the end of this session we have time earmarked for questions and answers and it would really help us moderate it better if you could please type in your questions the second as most of you know the cyclone amphan made landfall on the eastern part of the country just a couple of days back we are based in kolkata and some of us are still facing some connectivity issues as such if there is any technical disruption i apologize in advance and we ensure you that we will make sure that the webinar goes on as planned with that said let me move on to our first speaker our first speaker is mr philip barrett mr barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious doon school in dehradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions mr barrett served the doon school as house master head of department dean of student welfare dean of activities deputy headmaster second master and acting headmaster with great distinction he also carried out a visioning exercise for the doon school in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of british public schools and various schools in the us mr barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at wellington college uk in the year 2000 he is an athlete an adventurer and a naturalist too it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome mr barrett uh thank you shubhayu i hope i can be i'm i'm audible perfectly sir yeah okay and uh, and good evening to achan our esteemed panel and all our guests who have tuned in this evening i want to start by talking about uh, something i read recently it was written by a nurse who was involved with palliative care for over 40 years in australia and while she saw her patients dying and helped them to die peacefully she also recorded some of their their, their you know what they said about their last last uh, you know days on the earth and one of the really leading uh, comments that they made was that they all wished that they had done what they wanted to do and they all wished that they had followed their hearts instead of living lives for others and that brings me to um, you know thomas merton the cistercian monk who said um, that men and women climb the ladder of success all their lives only to find sometimes towards the end of their lives that this ladder was against the wrong wall all the time and so discouragement and depression unhappiness and frustration and ill health in terms of diabetes and cardiac problems are often our body's way of showing us the trouble even if our mind doesn't understand what's going on and many of us are living lives that others have designed 
planned or bribed us into doing. As a teacher, I know that education is about bringing out what is there, not about putting things into people, by creating an environment that brings out what child children have. This is good schooling. The old school style of putting information through lectures and notes into people and expecting them to regurgitate this during exams was all wrong. Things are changing now. And each one of us is born with talents, affinities, our own skill sets, our assets, our learning styles, our propensities. And all along, we are told that this is wrong and that we have to follow other, other you know, our, our parents and elders. Loving parents and, uh, and adults recognize this difference and encourage this uniqueness that resides in each one of us. If you look at what children want to do, it is to play, to jump, to make noise, to move, scream, laugh, make a mess, sing, dance, paint, ask questions, explore. And what do parents want? They want us to sit still, pay attention, write fast, do sums, learn tables, spell difficult words, settle up our mess, eat all the food, be quiet, come first in class, be good at sport, learn music, etc., etc. Why this clash? You know, do parents want us to be obedient, pliable, moldable children? Is that what they want? And I think a lot is to do with the unfinished business that parents carry around. Some parents have failed to achieve or to do the things they wanted to do all their lives and or, or didn't do what they wanted to do in life. And they want to live lives through their children. It's almost like, you know, I didn't do it. My kid will do it. And children are not here to complete parents' unfinished and unresolved issues, but to grow into the unique people that they were always meant to be. They have to follow their own path. Often I hear parents tell me they were gold medalists, top sportsmen, women, mountain climbers, etc. But hidden underneath that information is a hint that they also expect their children to walk their own shoes and to be like them. I would define hatred as making people think and do and react in just the way you want them. And love is just the opposite. It is allowing your children to feel different, to grow and be independent. A lot of my thinking on independence comes from the stories of the mythologist Joseph Campbell, who said many lovely things in his lifetime. But he introduced to me at least a concept known as the hero's journey. And we are all invited to take this journey, not just one, but our lives are a series of journeys. It's like, a, it's like something like a leaf, a, a coil spring. We take these repeated journeys as we move upwards. Many of us refuse to take these journeys and as a result, get stagnant and do not grow. So Joseph Campbell also said that, you know, many movies from The Matrix, The Wizard of Oz, Star Wars, Finding Nemo, The Lion King, Lord of the Rings, a lot of these stories have the same theme that runs through them. The young boy or the girl is called. Dorothy was called out of her mundane existence in Kansas. And you are called to go on this journey. If you accept the call, you go into the next stage, which is the initiation. This is where you grow in the world outside. You, in this initiation, you meet all sorts of obstacles, evil spirits and fairies and witches. But you also meet a lot of people who help you along the way. Just think of you know, the story of you know, Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. And then after you experience and grow, you have to return. So the third part of the whole cycle of the hero's journey, after the, initi the call, the initiation, and then you must return home richer and you must bring home what you have learned. And this story is the story of Jesus, it's of Buddha, it's of Nelson Mandela, and closer to my heart, an ex dosco by the name of Bunker Roy, all followed their own journeys to become who they were and made their contribution to the world. But any call, any call to a journey requires solitude and suffering. You need a period of thinking and reflection before you go on to this journey. Now, I always have a, I, I always believe that weak-willed, strong-willed parents make weak-willed children. 
So if you impose your will on children too much and want them to be like you, then they will grow up pliant but weak-willed. And so many beautiful things that Joseph Campbell has quoted. For example, find a place inside where there is joy and the joy will burn out the pain. Follow your bliss and the universe will open doors where there, are, where there were only walls. Your sacred space is where you can find yourself again and again. The privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. The cave you fear to enter is the treasure you seek. Regrets are illuminations come too late. And you must give up the life you planned in order to have the life that is waiting for you. And the best one is if the path before you is clear, you probably are on someone else's path. You cannot follow another person's path. You've got to enter the forest at a point that is your very own. Um, I will end this by a small quote from the poet Khalil Gibran, the well-known Maronite poet from Lebanon. And this inspires me a lot. He says, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backwards, nor tarries with yesterday. So my only advice to a lot of teachers and parents out there is your children have to find their own path. All that we can do is to support, advise, and guide them. And they will forge their own paths to success. Thanks. Thank you so much, Subhayu. Thank you so much, sir, for those enlightening words. I'm sure everybody who's attending is enthralled and the sales of that book by Mr. Joseph Campbell is surely going to go up in the next few days on Amazon. With that, we move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO of Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, Ochin was the director at Deloitte before starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. Ochin is an avid reader and a passionate traveler. He has a keen interest in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He's a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce, and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He's also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to brand strategies. Achin, over to you. Thank you, Shubayu. Am I audible? Yep. Good evening, everyone. I, I once again welcome all of you to this interesting session on a topic which is build the world. Unless we dare to dream, we won't strive to achieve it. My special heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed panelists for today, for agreeing to take their time out and be here with us today to share their insights on this very interesting subject. Now in a situation like this, when children are at home, They must be really missing their friends and play sessions. Indeed, even if we want to, social distancing norms rightfully prevent us from setting them free. However, what we can do at this juncture is spend more time with them, have extended breakfast or dinner table conversations, and rejuvenate their spirits and encourage them to not only dare to dream big, but also work hard to achieve it. Now, in fact, although every child grows up to a separate individual with his own set of unique aspirations, practically just like our family names and traditions, 
Uh, Shubhayu, can we move to the next slide? Now, I believe dreams are also passed on from one generation to the other as a legacy. And within no time, the succeeding generation considered it, considers it is or her very own and ends up spending a lifetime chasing someone else's passion. Now, however, I firmly believe that this is unfair to burden children with our dreams and in the process, stop them from having their own. We can of course listen to them, help and mentor them with our own experiences of a lifetime. But once they grow up to be matured adults, they should be free to choose their own course of action, just like we have chosen ours. Now, this is a very interesting uh, thing that I wanted to discuss. First and foremost, our dream should never be constrained by our present circumstances. In fact, unless there's an element of free-spirited leapfrogging, it is only operational plan and not a song of their soul. In order to be a song of the soul, it can't be operational plan, right? Dreams cannot be charted out professionally. They can only be visualized emotionally from our hearts and not our brain. Thus, your right brain helps in visualizing where you want to be and your left brain helps you implement your vision and reach there. Now, I think everyone has a right to dream irrespective of age and existing social strata in life. Uh, Shubhav, can you move to the next slide, please? I remember one of my close British friends, grandmother, who at 99 wanted to visit Eiffel Tower on her wedding day, wedding anniversary, and climbed to the top using stairs on a full moon night in her wedding attire, as that was the place where her deceased husband had asked her hand when both of them were students studying theology at the University of Paris, many decades back, some 70, 75 years back. So this lady, when I met her, uh, she was very passionate, she was around 99, and she told me, this is my dream. Now dreams may defy all logic and practicality, but have a very sweet aspiration element in it, which really makes them so adorable. Also, I had once met a man in downtown Colombo, where just one dream, and that was to fly at least once in his life. For his entire life, he had worked as a porter in the cargo section of the airport and had seen many flights vanishing into the horizon. But what he always aspired what was to understand how he felt sitting inside it and flying into the sunset. Now, this man had a large family and even larger economic needs to take care of. So he had plans to book his maiden trip once he fulfills all his responsibilities, which may take more than a lifetime and many, many more sunsets. Now, moving on, very often, real life offers us stories which even real life won't consider believable. We are towering uh, world leaders, should have a next slide, please, who literally rose from very humble beginnings and have left an indelible impression in this world with all their towering presence, foresight. Now, I believe that we hear about stories which really inspire us to do well. I remember the story of a tea stall owner. Now his two sons had cracked IIT. I also read about the daughter of an auto-rickshaw driver topping chartered accountancy exams. These are real life incidents and there are many more of this in and around us. But what is it that really makes these people unique and gives them the strength to achieve what on the surface is seemingly difficult, if not impossible at all? Now, moving on. The single most important factor that sets them apart is the love for what they dream. Hence, they literally live them day in and day out. So, 
it is no longer an operational hard task but something that they love to do so once you are passionate about something you will definitely put your heart into it and once your heart takes over from your brain rest is bound to follow as all the hard work that you put in will never be a pain for you now moving on i believe i literally believe in the adage that every challenge is an opportunity as it tests your endurance and the entry barriers into anything which is coveted also becomes your safety net in future life cannot be wasted always following the conventional path we should have the courage to follow our heart and also the self belief and discipline to execute our vision now moving on in life getting a head start definitely counts as it helps in getting an initial take off velocity but that's not the only thing that counts right very often we have seen families producing political leaders actors and entrepreneurs across generations but in every generation there are also achievers who arrive out of nowhere and rule the world with their insane passion and mental determination now i'll 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 share an inspiring case in public memory of the 16th president of united states of america abraham lincoln who was born in humble surroundings a one room log cabin with dirt floors in hardin county kentucky the man who preserved the union and issued the emancipation proclamation had a childhood in rural kentucky and then frontier indiana where his father was a farmer and a carpenter and could not read and only barely sign his name his father in fact built a crude 360 square feet log cabin where the family lived his mother nancy died when lincoln was only 9 years old similarly we we have also seen people who were born with a silver spoon but could never carry the burden of monumental expectation and deliver thus their surnames only reminded us of a much more glorious past and always left us asking for more now moving on the career trajectory of one of our honorable former presidents who has been who has been one of the tallest leaders in our recent times and also held several important cabinet portfolios reads as follows he started his career as a upper division clerk in the office of deputy accountant general in calcutta in 1963 he became a lecturer of political science also worked as a journalist before entering politics and the rest is history so what i guess is most important is never to give up that's most most important we also get many such examples in the world of sports a very inspiring incident that i'd like to share with all of you is that of wilmer rudolph rudolph was born prematurely in 1940 she was the 20th of 22 children born to her dad across two marriages she went on to become a pioneering african american track and field champion but but her road to victory was not an easy one stricken with double pneumonia scarlet fever and polio as a child she had problems with her left leg and had to wear a brace now with great determination and the help of physical therapy she was able to overcome all her disabilities she overcame them not only she overcame them she competed in 1956 summer olympics and then 1960 she became the first american woman to win three gold medals in track and field in a single olympic later in life she also formed a foundation to promote amateur athletics a very inspiring indeed now moving to the role of teachers and parents i think parents and teachers have a very important role in shaping a child's dream the role of a elder is that of a mentor who can be a patient listener a sounding board a confession box and someone who will at least offer 
their own unbiased perspective on various issues based on our past experiences and also guide them to our contacts who may have more to contribute in the particular field. Now, we get practical insights on how to work on small pilot projects, etc., to understand more about the passion. Now, it is important not to impose but to inspire them to follow their heart and achieve milestones that are dear to them. Now, the role of a teacher is very important, very important. No words are enough to thank a teacher who can help us chase our dream, dreams. That's indeed true. I think we have a wonderfully diverse panel today and I really look forward to hearing more from them on this. Would be happy to take your questions during our interactive session. Thank you all for giving me a patient hearing. Over to you, Shubhayu. Thank you, Ochin. Thank you for those wonderful examples and the inspiring stories. It is now my privilege to you to introduce to you our next speaker. Our next speaker is Brigadier Steve Ishmael. Brigadier Ishmael is an army officer with 32 years of leadership and training experience in demanding military assignments. He is a postgraduate in defense studies. Besides military command and staff assignments, he has headed the NCC Officers Training Academy in Gwalior for women teachers from across India. Most recently, he was head of training at the Indian Military Academy in Dehradun. He is shortly moving to Mo Modhya Pradesh as Commander Young Officers Wing at the Infantry School. So it is indeed our privilege to have you with us. Over to you. Thank you, Tuvayu. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes, sir. Loud and clear. All right. Good evening to one and all. And I must thank Tuvayu and Philip Barrett and the others at Notebook for giving me this opportunity to speak with teachers and parents. I am not a teacher, but I am a parent and I am a trainer. And I think the topic of today's webinar that is chasing your dreams is very relevant for parents and teachers and mentors. To take a step back and look at what they are actually doing. When I say what they're actually doing, I mean, are we teaching or are the children learning? I often make this distinction when I speak to trainers that so many times we are so focused on training, on teaching, on covering the curriculum, perhaps very well, perhaps perfectly, that we lose sight completely of the very reason why we are there. We are not there to teach. We are there to see that children learn. Now, what do they learn? Unfortunately, the education system is such that it has become curriculum heavy. Now, I'm not going to go into that. The teachers would know the reasons for that perhaps better than I do. But the result is that the majority of our children who have dreams confine those to narrow career options. And it is not uncommon for people to confuse dreams with career options. Very recently, I was talking to a teacher who told me about another teacher whose son was a very talented guitarist, had a room in his house, which is almost like a studio, wrote his own scores and was completely passionate about his guitaring and his music. But his parents told him that son, this can be your hobby, but you will not be independent if you follow this in your life. Now, what is this independent? We need to stop and think. Fundamentally, this concept is one that is driven by insecurity and a desire for monetary gain and monetary security. So children who have dreams which are 
supposedly not the ones that will lead to rewarding careers tend to be discouraged and tend to be pushed away from pursuing those dreams and tend to be led to believe that there is something wrong with them actually thinking the way they do now some of you may be wondering why an army type on a topic like this well effective leadership depends on understanding and inspiring people so maybe i can bring some of that to the table today on this topic of chasing dreams the reality in our country and i've served in a very large number of very remote and rural areas across the country is that most schools do not even have teachers teachers are often absent they hire an un, uh, just a graduate who's an unemployed graduate they give him a stipend he stands in as a teacher in the school while they run some other lucrative business in the town now what do the children who undergo an experience of this sort come to believe i will not call it education they time waits for no one they pass through the school they reach a certain age and a certain class they given a piece of paper on which it says that they have passed class 12 or class 10 and they go out thinking that they are educated and the world is waiting for them but what do they find they find that they are unemployable they find that nobody values what they have and that results in resentment that results in disappointment so the first and foremost need is exposure to choices what possibly can i do in life a very large number of our children are limited in their choices by the limited exposure that they have perhaps to their families or others known to them or people in the village or whatever it is and therefore it's a very small tiny little corner of perhaps their potential i once met a very bright young boy in a tea shop i used to be i posted up in the hills somewhere and i used to be going up and down and it was about 6 hours there was a little tea shop i used to stop and have tea and there was this very bright boy and he lived across there was a river behind that and he told me he lived across i got friendly with him over a period of time and i asked him i said ki what do you learn in school and he just looked at me and he said nothing much but then he told me that the teacher takes tuition and he told me that that is in the morning before the official school hours etc and but he couldn't attend it because he lived across the river and he couldn't come so it was so sad to see a very bright young boy curious full of spark but i know sadly there's a blank as far as his dreams go parental ambitions have already been spoken about by a lot of people and the fact that parents often like to live their dreams or their unfulfilled dreams to their children as philip barrett mentioned and parents also make a lot of emotional and financial investment into children and children naturally look up to their parents as being the most loving sensible people in their lives and it's very difficult for a young child to actually face the reality that perhaps the guidance that the parent is giving is not the guidance that he or she should be receiving so there is a lack of dream mentoring a role that few parents and teachers are ready for so what do i actually mean by dream mentoring i would like to just share some ideas of this and i would like to draw on the military perspective which is my domain of expertise to try and explain what perhaps teachers mentors and parents could do to be better mentors of dreams the military as you know trains for an ultimate mission and all our lives 
we spend rehearsing contingencies training building ourselves up but before we do any of the actual training of our whatever our tasks are we spend years in a cauldron a boiling hot uncomfortable a time savage cauldron that forges us first melts us down and then lifts us up and rebuilds us as capable of undertaking those missions and those journeys all achievement all the famous people we talk about every single one of them has a back story a back story which is underwritten by failure not by success by disappointment by rejection by pain disillusionment despair not a pleasant journey every single achiever in every field so this teaches us that chasing dreams is not enough to make a dream come true you have not merely to chase it you have to work on yourself and this ladies and gentlemen is the core idea i would like to leave with all of you today it is our capacity to overcome those challenges rejection and disappointments to fall down seven times get up eight as the japanese like to say it is that capacity which will make us capable of chasing a dream we must learn as teachers and parents to value effort over talent now this is a concept which is pioneered by a psychologist called dr carol dweck who is a proponent of the concept of the growth mindset which believes that achievement is the result of effort and perseverance and not of talent she also believes that children and she has proved this in experiments children who are praised for their talent which we are also guilty of learn to avoid risk because children are transparent and they seek approval they seek validation they seek that pat on the back they seek that wow and praising someone for talent wow you're a really intelligent girl is only teaching that child to repeat the performance that will get her or him that praise whereas it has been found that praising children for effort teaches them that the way to get praise is to put in effort in an experiment by dr carol dweck and others a large number of children were given mathematical problems they were children in grade 8 they were given problems to begin with starting from fifth grade problems which were very easy for them they were divided into two groups the problems were the same one group when they did it well were told wow you're really intelligent the other group was not told wow they were asked how did you do it okay fine that's good and the problems were made more and more difficult over a period of weeks to the point where finally the degree of difficulty of the problems was much higher than any of those children could possibly have solved the group that had been consistently praised for being intelligent gave up but the group that had been praised for being persevering for their effort did not give up even when it was impossible for them to solve the problem they just didn't give up they kept trying now this is the growth mindset so as teachers as mentors we must remember our biggest role is to develop 
grit and resilience in a child. In certain circumstances, certain children, because of their circumstances, their life deals them such a bad hand. They're knocked down so many times that they either develop resilience or grit or they just evaporate. We certainly cannot do that for most children. But we must keep on give, taking them out of their comfort zone. If you are good at something, you like to keep doing that again and again. But that will not make you grow. When I was commandant of the NCC at OTA, we used to get teachers aged from 25 to 45. And they used to come to us for three months. And the first and foremost thing I used to do was, I used to look at how to take them out of their comfort zone. No two teachers of the same state stayed in the same room. I asked them, okay, what games do you play? So, so we had a choice of some games, volleyball, table tennis, badminton, basketball. So somebody said, I'm a volleyball player. I made sure they never played volleyball. Somebody said, I'm a basketballer. I made sure they only played table tennis. They said, but we don't know how to play table tennis. I said, that's why you're here. Because I want you to grow. And it's only when you fail that you can grow. Ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you, I was a very mediocre student in my student days. For reasons I shall not go into, I never went to school till the age of 11, the age of nine, till fourth class. I never attended school. It was a struggle for me. I failed in class eight. I couldn't meet the requirement. In class 11, I topped the All India Merit List for joining the National Defense Academy and subsequently have always worked hard on army courses where my talented friends would just maybe study a little bit. I used to slog just to keep up with them. So the important takeaway is that I would like to leave with you is to promote a growth mindset. Remember the power of yet. If a child says, I'm not good in maths, that's the end of the story. But if a child says, I'm not good in maths yet, it speaks of being better tomorrow. It speaks of growth. Therefore, as mentors, we must inspire trust Enable understanding by becoming role models in not praising children for talent, not ignoring those who are supposedly not intelligent, not saying stand outside the class, you are disturbing the class because you're asking questions. I know it's difficult. Please engage. As a soldier, I can tell you the ones who are disturbing the class are, I hate to say this, they're actually the most intelligent people. Because they are people who are thinking outside the box. They are people who are going beyond what's happening around them. And we have seen in crisis in the military that these kind of people are the ones who are innovative, who are creative, who are inventive. So they need to be engaged and they need to be channelized. They need to be given responsibility. They need to be taken out of their comfort zone and told to do things for which they can be validated. Because at the end of the day, every child is looking for validation. That, I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts and let's have a growth culture of grit and adversity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for those enlightening words. It's wonderful to listen in on all your experiences and I'm sure those takeaways that you shared would stand everybody here in good stead in the days to come. Thank you so much. We'll move on to our next speaker now. It is an absolute privilege to introduce to you Dr. Rajeshwari Sawant. Dr. Sawant is the principal of the Gwalior Glory High School in Gwalior, Madhya Pradesh. She is an experienced principal with a demonstrated history of working in the education management industry. In fact, she can be given most of the credit for single-handedly taking the Gwalior Glory High School into one of the foremost schools in the city of Gwalior and in that region. She is skilled in internal audit, crisis intervention, interpersonal skills, internal controls, and intellectual property. She's won numerous awards and accolades, including the Best Teacher and Best Principal Awards multiple times. She was also awarded the Best Zonal Principal Award by the Science Olympiad Foundation a few years back. She holds an MA, MED, PhD, 
focused in English language and literature and letters from Bangalore University. It is indeed my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Dr. Rajeshwari Sawant. Dr. Sawant, over to you. Thank you, Subhayu, for the introduction. Uh, after the eminent speakers have spoken uh, before me, there's very little that I can add, but still as an educationist, I would like to say that uh, this theme that you people have taken up for today's webinar, Chasing Dreams, is very apt because uh, the kind of competitiveness that exists in the world today has, you know, kind of killed the dreams of children. Every child dreams to be something great in this world. It could be a sports person, it could be a musician, it could be an artist, it could be a, a theater personality, it could be an actor. But the focus that, that, that is predominantly there on children these days is to be an engineer, a doctor, a chartered accountant, a lawyer. Why can't we allow children to dream? Because the stronger the dreams are, they will manifest into reality. Dreaming is very, very important because Sigmund, Sigmund Freud, a great psychologist, has uh, in fact written a book, Interpretation of Dreams. And these dreams are, are so strong that if you pursue those dreams, recall what happened in the dream the next day and follow it, you will definitely be able to achieve what you have dreamt of. As the speakers earlier have told that if you're passionate, you can definitely pursue that and reach that goal that you have set for yourself. So my advice as a principal to students, to parents, to the listeners here today is that allow the child to follow his passion. It's extremely important that the child follow the passion that he is passionate about, pursue it, guide him to, you know, find out ways in which he can, you know, groom himself to follow that and help him become what he wants to become. We are forcibly making children study subjects which they are just not interested in. Yes, there is a basic qualification of class 10 and class 12 to be passed by a child. But once they do that, which is the basic qualification in this country, a child can pursue any field that he's passionate about. And that passion, if we nurture right from the time the child begins to dream and help him in realizing that dream, he will definitely be able to take it forward. As parents, it's very important to be supportive. Many a times what happens is we turn down the wish of the child. But it is extremely important that we support the child, guide him and you know give him the pros and cons of whatever line that he chooses for himself and then get him to meet the right people who can train him and then take it forward. Now there are a few things that I would like to advise students is that yes, Passion is an important part of uh, fulfilling one's dream. But then they should set a goal, a particular goal which they have to achieve. As Brigadier Ismail also told, that once you set a target, you have to achieve it. Yes, you set goals, have those breaks where you have those short-term goals which will help you in moving towards the long-term goals. And then achieve that goal that you've set for yourself. That is something which you need uh, to motivate yourself, read success stories of people who have achieved uh, greatly. You know, they have started from scratch and that. Meet people who can guide, who can inspire you. And definitely you can, uh, you know, take your goal forward and reach it. Besides that, as schools, I don't know what other schools could be doing. But uh, when the child moves out of the primary schooling, there is something called an interest test which is administered for children in class six. And this interest test reveals the areas that the child has interest in. And you can build on that interest. It could be sports, it could be music, it could be dance, it could be uh, you know, anything. It could be engineering, mechanics. The child can be, be specializing in mechanics. So any of the fields that the child has interest in, this interest test reveals. And then you need to pursue in the next classes, that is class 7, class 8, class 9, whether this interest that the child has shown in, according to the scores, 
remains the same or it has changed. And then when you come to class 9, class 10, an aptitude test is administered where you easily come to know whether the child is good in the sciences, the child is good in the mathematics field, the child is good in the commerce field, or the child is good in the humanities, the arts field. And accordingly, you guide that child to take up that particular stream because children are very strongly influenced by peers. Peer pressure plays a very, very vital role at this stage of class 9th and 10th, where children you know, want to take up a course just because the friend has taken it up. But this is the place where the teachers, the counselors at school, the mentors need to guide the children and at the same time counsel parents. Because many a times parents don't understand that the child does not have the aptitude for mathematics or science, but is extremely good in oratory skills. So he could be taking up humanities and perhaps pursue law. So that is the point where the school steps in and counsels parents, counsels the child and helps him in picking up the right stream so that he can build his career accordingly. Because the world is extremely competitive. And it's not just the, you know, the locality or the place where he's staying in. He could make a place for himself in the country or anywhere in the world. Today, the educational world has become so uh, compact that one can uh, get a job any, in any part of the world if he specializes in a particular field that he is strongly passionate about. So my advice to parents, my advice to students, my advice to educators is to guide the children. It's extremely important because there's no child who comes to school not to study. Every child has some intention in coming to school. He may come to school not to attend the classes of science and maths. He may be wanting to play in the field, which is the reason why he comes to school and looks forward to those sports periods. So the teacher needs to identify that and channelize the child. Doesn't matter if he scores a 33% in academics, but then groom him towards that particular sport which the child is passionate about so that he can make a place for himself in this particular field. So my advice to parents, please understand your child, teachers to counsel the children and ensure that every child understands what he is good for and choose that particular line of interest and make him dream. Make him dream about that particular passion that he has and show him people who have achieved that level of greatness and help him achieve that greatness for himself. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Listening to you, it becomes very clear that what has made Gwalior Glory High School such an outstanding school in its region. Thank you so much. We shall move on to our next speaker now. Our next speaker is Mrs. Nita Ganguly. Mrs. Ganguly is an educator, a humanist, a motivator, an attitude changer, an author, a climate leader, and a mentor in the environmental field. She's a certified climate leader and presenter with the Nobel Laureate and the former Vice President of US, Mr. Al Gore's The Climate Project in 2008, now called The Climate Reality Project. She's been a Fulbright Scholar for the year 2009. And she was invited by NIH Roorkee to present a talk on the role of field-based field water testing kits, Jaltara, in protecting water sources on December 2011. She's been the chairperson of the Cantonment Board Schools Management Committee of the Cantonment Board School Ruki in the year 2011-12. She was selected as a climate change educator skill share by Australian Leadership Awards Fellowship in May 2013. She mentored the emerging GELF young leaders in the annual summit LIFE, which is Leadership Initiative for Excellence 2013. She was invited by the Regional Science City Lucknow to give the Silver Jubilee Popular Science Lecture on the topic Climate Change in 2014. She has a long list of achievements to her name. Let me just try and name a few. She was awarded the South Sudha Balchandra Bapad Award in B.Ed. 1991. She had the Best Eco Club School Award for the year 2001-2002, the national winner of Unsung Heroes No Longer 2004, Rustam Irani Foundation Award, for excellence in education at the National Proficiency Evaluation. She won the Development Alternatives Best Clean Delhi School Award 2003 and 4. She won the Bhagidari Award 2006 and 2009. 
the Center for Science and Environment Award, All India Gobert Times Green School Award 2006, Environment Education Promoters Excellence in Teaching Award 2010, and Innovative Teaching Practices in Delhi and NCR in 2011, Pearson Teachers Award 2013, the AWWA Awards of Excellence 2017. She conducts multiple workshops and has authored several books for children, specifically in the area of climate change. It is my privilege to you, a privilege to introduce to you, Mrs. Nita Ganguly. Mrs. Ganguly, if you're there, if you could please switch on your camera. Hello, good evening. Good evening. As we will have a small chat, so let yeah. me switch on my camera as well. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Ms. Gawal, it's our privilege to have you here with us today. Uh, Thank you. Let me start by asking you about your general views on our topic today, which is chasing your dreams. We have take, tackled the topic from multiple dimensions now. Uh, your personal take on this. Um, in fact, um, let me begin with some verses. I heard this song today itself. It's a uh, Filipino's uh, uh, you know, uh, singer, Sharon Regis, and it's called uh, Follow Your Dreams. And um, it's, uh, there was a para which I really uh, liked it, and it goes like this. Follow your dreams, the courage found within. Your soul is keeping you so strong that you could rise each time you fall and stand up on your own. This time, you won't go wrong. Just give your best to hold your will. So, um, Shubhayu. I mean, I thought this was a very apt for today's uh, topic, so I picked it up. Um, so my take on this, I will give you four examples, all right? I'll start with myself first. Uh, you know, we are not born teachers. We learn from our teachers, from our parents. That is, that is the learning we did. But as an educator, I've always, I was very particular about certain things. Obviously, when I was in school, there were some teachers I didn't like. And I made it a point that I will not become them. That's important. You know, you, you pick up the best, you pick up the positivity, and then you carry, carry it on and you take it forward. So um, I'm a twin. I have a twin sister and I have an older brother. And um, I was a happy-go-lucky child. And I always wanted to be a teacher. My parents are teachers. My mother, she was a chemistry teacher. My father was in Delhi University. And we have been brought up in that background, I always wanted to be a teacher and I became a teacher. So my mine is a very common and there was no struggle. And my sister, on the other hand, my twin, you know, we, we got into the college together, but she wanted to be a professional. So she changed her line and she moved into dentistry, which I never wanted to do because uh, I wanted to be a teacher and I thought doing graduation was the best thing. And my brother, on the other hand, uh, was very keen on engineering, but he was the, the brightest person in this house. So, uh, you know, at that time, when he had to give the exams, he got into Mansi first, Mulan Azad Medical College. And then later on, he got into IIT Kharagpur, he got into Pitts Pilani. But then when I asked him, how come you became a doctor when you wanted to become an engineer? He says, well, uh, the day I had already given my certificate to the Mansi and I got into IIT Kharagpur, I was very happy. I wanted to go, but it was a very hot, it was in Delhi, so it was a very hot day. It was too hot. I, it was too hot for me to go and get my certificates and give it for engineering. So I became a doctor. So when I look back on this, I thought, you know, how come it was so easy for us? That's because of the teachers we had and the parents we had. We didn't have parents who expected something from us and imposed their views. They just allowed us to be whatever we wanted to be. And that's important, that you have to allow a child to have their own dream, pursue their own dream, follow their own dream. After all, I cannot dream for somebody else. But I can. I only have to make the environment as comfortable, as motivating, as uh, you know, trustworthy as possible. And that's what my parents did. So this is a very, very, very nice situation. I'll give you a second situation. When my daughter graduated, I, in fact, asked my daughter, did, we, did I in any way push you into becoming a dentist? She's a dentist. So she said, no. 
But when I remember when they passed the 12th standard and they got into different colleges, uh, my husband, he were, we, he's just retired from the army. We were that time, I was in the separated quarters in Delhi and all the friends came home. And when they came home, uh, they were, I asked, you know, I, I have taught them in 10th standard, I asked to teach biology. So I just asked them, so where are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And everyone told me exactly which college and most of them, as you said, are either medicine or engineering. They were going for or law. That was the three things which was. And there was one boy who was in the, you know, he was in the party and he says, ma'am, I'm going to Bangalore to study music mixing. I said, music mixing? You mean study means? Is that your degree course? He says, no, it's just a six months course, which I will go and do it. And then I will get into music. I said, uncle, what about your graduation? He says, ma'am, if I get into graduation college now, it will take me three years to go back to mixing. This is a new profession. If I don't plunge into it now, it will be too late for me to get into it after three years after doing my graduation. And that's the first time that a child taught me. I was not aware opened my eyes, uh, told me to hear lady think out of the box. Okay, this is also possible. You don't have to do the mundane, the same thing, what stereotype things which we have always followed. You don't need to do it. You can build and you can make your life also. And that was a learning step. I've always considered to, me a, to be a student teacher and that's when the student learned something from my own student. And that was wonderful. I, I thought this is something which I will uh, imbibe and I will take it forward. But before I came to adopt this in Sanskriti school, when I was a fresh teacher from Piet College, fresh, absolutely fresh teacher, I had no experience of being a teacher, but I always had a passion of becoming a teacher because that was my dream to become a teacher. And with, this is with my first batch of children which I taught. And in that class, it was class seven, and there used to be this boy, short little boy, he used to be at the corner of one class and was always very quiet. And when I first took the first unit test, this boy would not score more than zero or half. That's all he scored. And I was teaching maths and I was teaching science. Sorry, I was teaching science in that class. Zero or half. But I said, you know, then I found out that this boy is an artist. He's a wonderful artist, but he was a scared artist because everybody around him were achievers and he was not achieving anything in the class. And that's when I realized, but this guy is an artist and science is nothing but all about figure. What if I can teach science through art? And I changed my mode of teaching and I changed my mode of questioning. And my questioning totally changed because I was teaching science. So my question was draw and explain, draw and explain, draw and explain. I told this boy that, listen guy, you are a wonderful artist. He's not able to grasp the facts. I said, you look at the picture and you understand the science behind the picture. And when I ask you a question, you just draw and explain. And the child started to achieve. He started to score because he could explain the concept of science much better. So maybe, maybe I helped him to, you know, pursue his dream because he did became, become an artist later on. So it's not that you, because you're an artist, and you cannot score in school, you don't pursue it. Maybe I did, because you know, in the army, you keep getting posted out. So then the same year, you know, I taught another girl in that same school and I would take the names. And I was in touch with these children because we used to write to each other. At that time there were letters and I started writing and children started writing back. And there was one girl who used to write regularly. And I used to keep getting a letter once a month. And then once, all of a sudden, I had a feeling that this girl who's writing to me is not happy because she was a brilliant student. And I'm sorry to say she was from an army background. Her parents were from the army background too. But as you say, like uh, an educated person can be literate but not all literate person
can be called educated. And this is an absolute and apt case for this. I could sense that this girl, through her letter, is getting suicidal. I sensed it. And I started writing every day to her. I motivated her. I told her what was her desire, what was her wish. She had finished the 12th standard and she had scored brilliantly. All her dream was to, was to get into a college. That's all she wanted, to study and get into a college and do English honors. She got the admission, but I don't know for what reason this father of hers, you know, and they, I, I believe that there, 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 there was some problem in the house and the family had the marital problem in the house. The father got separated, mother got separated. She had, was by force, was asked to stay with the father and the father had thing had the second wife. I don't, I, I got the sense of it, but the father just didn't want her to study. He wanted her to get married. So he's, she's out of her, of his head. So it really scared me because I could see a person who's going to plunge into something drastic. And that's when I started writing to her daily. At that time, there were no, there were no, there were only ordinary telephones. There were no mobiles. There was no uh, Skyping. There was no, there was no way to contact but through letters. And I constantly started making grounds for her, building up her, you know, a self-confidence told her to trust me, told her to start trusting herself. What I told her mainly is to start loving yourself. Stop doing it for others. When a person stops, starts living for others, that's when you are living somebody else's dream. That's not the dream you can live. You have to live your own dream. And to live your own dream, it's very important that the person starts loving yourself. I love myself. I told her in front of the mirror, you go and say, I love myself. I love myself. When I say you love yourself, I'm not asking you to be selfish. It's not being selfish. It's just that you bring in your self-confidence. You tell yourself that this is what the dreams I have. This is what I want to do. And this is what I'm going to do. You bring in your confidence it's because if you love yourself and if you are happy, then only you can spread happiness to others. And somehow, through constantly writing to her, I once got a letter from her and she said she has taken that bold step to question, to argue with her father, which she couldn't do it. You know, she just couldn't do it. And she took a step and she went for her college degree. She went, moved into a, 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 a hostel and she moved on. And then later on, I got in touch with her. She got married and her life changed. So as an educator, as a parent, as an elderly, my only thing is that I can only help you in achieving your dream. That's what we need to do. No matter how weird your dream is, but it's your dream. Go and live your dream. If your passion and if your profession can be the same thing, wonderful. But if your passion cannot match your profession, that doesn't mean you give away, give up your passion. Don't give up your passion. Please have your profession because it's important to balance between your heart and your head. You definitely need your finance to maintain yourself. But do your profession, whatever you're doing, but definitely Give that time for your passion too. Do pursue it. Maybe you won't get it in six months or one year. You may get it after 10 years. There are people who are leaving their jobs and moving into the uh, wilderness or they're going for farming. They're pursuing their passion. So don't give up your passion. Don't give up your dream just because you can't achieve it right now. Nurture it. Make it stronger. Build it. Work on it, but definitely when the time is right, go for your dreams. Because it's important to be happy. It's important that you definitely live your dream. Whenever it comes to you, just enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, my next question to you, uh, we'll bring it a little closer home, make it a little personal. 
Okay. You were very passionate about teaching. You became a teacher. Yes. And then eventually you quit teaching. Yes. And you became a huge advocate for climate change with the whole Al Gore project. Uh, could you walk us through that journey as somebody who did follow her dream? Well, I taught for 24 years and I enjoyed it. I was first a teacher. I, was te I taught in different places. My husband got uh, posted uh, from Sanskriti school. When we moved to Roorkee, that's when you were speaking about Roorkee. He, took, he was commanding the hospital over there. And that's when I became a headmistress of the army public school over there. I enjoyed it. I brought in a sea change over there because as uh, Brigadier said, uh, most of the places the teachers were just teaching out of the textbook. And they were the whole concern was to give the children those 10 questions put in just uh, uh, introduce it into their textbook and ask the same question in the in the question in the test and they just vomit it out they cannot handle any other question out of the box and that's when i changed the whole system of teaching made it totally kind of aesthetic uh, i worked with the teachers and i told them exactly how to go about it I even taught, even I had to go to the extent of teaching them how to use a com uh, computer effectively, how to make question papers, do away with your what, where, why, explain how, describe questions and go into application based questions. I did that for two years. I did that. We got posts again. We went to Lucknow. Again, I became a headmistress. I started doing that. It was like one year with the school. I worked like anything. The next year it was on autopilot. You know, so this was the second thing in Lucknow when it happened. It was an autopilot mood and all. I don't know why all of a sudden, sudden I was enjoying it. I had to take up the principalship of that of the school in APS because the principal had to go through some um, uh, medical treatment. So I did the six months of uh, principalship, and when I hated it with a passion because it was only administration. There was no creativity and there was too much of, uh, so, uh, sorry to say, but uh, there are too much of paperwork and red tapism that army public schools have. Too much of paperwork. It's only paper, 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 and uh, it, it was so boring. It was very that. boring. Actually, it, 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 it made me really, uh, I didn't enjoy what I was doing. And I was just waiting for the principal to come back and take her seat I, and I, she was she was actually going through a cancer treatment and she was really bad and i just told her nothing doing you have to get okay you have to come back you have to take your seat because i'm just warming it for you and the moment she came back i just quit how why i quit because there was a time when she came back i started looking at my watch i was waiting for the school to get over i've never done that in my life and this is the first time I did it. And that's when I thought to myself, if I am looking at my watch to see whether this, when the school is getting over, then I am not in the right place. I, I feel teaching is a profession. You have to give 100%. And I, I, and I consider teaching as a profession. It is not a charity. It is not my pastime. It's my profession. And I take it very seriously. And when I was started, I started looking at my watch. I said, this is not Maybe I need to move on. And then I thought of moving on. I just quit. I went to my daughter. I came back. I started taking workshop because that's what I've been doing for five years in the APS, taking workshops to teach teachers how to teach effectively in class. And I started doing that with more teachers, you know, and I enjoyed it. Then, of course, we got posted to Delhi and I wrote these two books. And now I enjoy working from home. I work. I do various things and all. I have, I, I, I'm now living my dreams. Of course, teaching was also my dream, but I moved on from there. And I am an educator of a different kind. I'm a motivator. And I enjoy what I'm doing. Sitting at home, and right now I'm talking to you, I love it. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not something which you have to do it professionally. You can do it. Now it's, it's something which I'm doing as of my passion. So I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now. Reaching out to as many people as possible. That's fantastic. As you're talking about the administrative challenges of being a principal, I could see Dr. Sawan smiling there. I know she harbors very similar views on the administrative side of being a principal. That's One last question. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, you have been with multiple army public schools, two of them. Yeah. I'm sure you have had your share of army brats as well. Oh, yes. And it, is, it has been common knowledge that 
a lot of people who are bratish in their school days somehow their dreams their passions are not taken as seriously as the ones who are more studious or perhaps have a few awards to their names what do you do with kids like those um i don't belong to that category of teachers first of all um as uh, brigadier said the ones who make the most noise and the one who are sitting at the at the they actually get a wider view you know children who are sitting right at the back they get a wider view so their horizon is even bigger than children who are sitting right in front i don't believe in that uh, it all depends see uh, there is nothing like a uh, there is a something fixed which you have it all depends from person to person it depends upon how you are exposed uh what is the situation you go through and definitely the guidance of the teacher definitely works you know it it's required but you know the children of today's world are so lucky which we never had it they have this wonderful thing known as a technology the internet they can surf they know they know the world much better than us we are still struggling do you know this so uh there are different kinds of children yes they are brats uh, my way of handling brat was totally different i had brats of all kinds which i faced so there was this one particular boy who used to be very violent in class uh, and he even came to the extent that he used to even stab you know children with the pencil and he very violent and it was like every day minimum it's like a like a medical dose you know it's three times a day he used to do it so my solution was i used to not call the parents and embarrass them i was to not shout at the boy and make him feel small i used to not do that i did nothing of that kind all i did was in my room we had a little space very comfortable place a chair and a table and you know for his water bottle and all so whenever that every classroom has a timetable and in the timetable there are teaching periods where the teacher is in the class but there are periods when you have the music class the then the then the dance class and you have the sports period and the break where there is no teacher to supervise you those were the periods that boy had to come and spend quality time with me so i used to talk to him and all so it was like his only his punishment was to come and sit with me and whenever the classes used to begin the teacher used to will have to come take him to the class and again hand him back to me so obviously how is he the boy he's just in class 5 4 5 i don't remember that so obviously how long does he want to spend time with me i used to give him books to read and do a thing and talk to him but he was getting bored of me so slowly his time you know which was for 15 days became 10 days to became one week and became four days and eventually he stopped coming to me at all because he says i rather behave myself than sit with mrs ganguly and of course when he is to not misbehave he should still come and pay his regard but that's how i treated him so i don't have to humiliate somebody make the person feel low about it call the parents and tell them you know how bad it is because parents you know you're humiliating a parent is not the answer you have to tackle the problem and the problem is tackled by tackling the problem and not adding some more problem to it but the child is confused with the child just because most children when you do that to them they just take it as a revenge you know and uh, like in when i was teaching in sanskriti school if there's time i can give you another example is there time yeah so when i was teaching in sanskriti school there was this boy and i was teaching biology over there and i taught through a powerpoint presentation i never used a chalk and board in my life never used i have always used hands on so i was doing i used to do this powerpoint presentation teaching biology in 10th standard and there was this one particular boy who used to they had to come to my class this class is to come to my class so whenever the class is to come and he used to come and you know hit the the wall and the chairs and all so i used to tell him 5 minutes i should give him 5 minutes and after that the time is mine so he used to sit quietly in my class not even facing me he may be facing the wall i never said anything to him that he's not looking at me he's not answering me he used to not submit his work he used to not do anything and his mother used to come for a pta meetings and all she used to visit me last because i used to only discuss the weather and everything with her but her son and uh, she actually used to enjoy that because she says 
for morning to evening, she's only hearing complaints about this boy because he had an issue with every teacher. The only issue with me was that uh, he was just doing whatever he wanted to do to irritate me and I was not getting irritated and I used to not get irritated, you know. So there was a time when they, uh, there were three classes together and I, this class came back. I had a substitution class, so it became three classes together. So when the class came to my class, uh, they came in with a basketball. So I knew they are coming with a purpose. And they said, ma'am, you have three consecutive classes. We want 10 minutes break between each classes. We want to go on, you know, uh, we, we can't study continuously. I said, fair enough, even I can't teach continuously. So they went out for 10 minutes. I said, but 10 minutes means 10 minutes. So when they went out, and it was about to, the time was about to get over. I heard a crash. I knew somebody, something has broken. And uh, there was a lamp fish. They were playing with the basketball and it broke. And the whole class came back and this boy comes back and he comes straight to me and he says, ma'am, I did not break it. I said, okay, fair enough. He says, no, ma'am, I did not break it. I said, okay, I understand. Fair enough, sit down, we'll start to deal with this class. He said, no, ma'am, you're not understanding. I did not break it. I said, you told me three times you did not break it. I understand. I believe you. He says, how can you believe me? I said, why can't I believe you? Because nobody believes me. I said, hello, you told me that you have not broken it. If you had broken it, the others would have told me, I believe you. Just come and sit down. We'll continue with the class. So I did not make an issue out of it. I did not take him to the principal. I don't do that. Because I feel a person who takes it child to a principal with a complaint is not capable of handling any child. The teacher is the problem, not the child. I totally believe in that. So I did not make it an issue. And because I did not make an issue, you wouldn't believe it, but the next class on was this boy was a totally a different person. Why? Because I believed in him. I had trust. I was not, I did not humiliate him. I respected him because a child has a bigger ego than an adult. So if I want somebody to respect me, I have to learn to respect that person first. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, you. With your kind of experience, I'm sure we can go on all day with these various <laughs> experiences you. you've had as a teacher. Thank you. But this was fantastic. And I'm Thank sure you. we'll continue with this some other time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much Thank for you. being with us today. Thank you. Well, it is now time to bring up the star cast. The next speaker that we have with us today is Jyoti Ann Barrett. Jyoti Ann Barrett is the striker for the Indian women's senior national football team in a country where sports, let alone women's sports, are taken very seriously, she has stood as an excellent example of following her dream of becoming a national level sports person. Jyoti was selected as a part of the 23 member squad for the AFC Women's Asian Cup qualifiers in the year 2014. She trained with the Tottenham Hotspurs, the Premier League club, during pre-season camp of 2012-13. She, with others, founded the Delhi Women's Football Players Welfare Association in the year 2017. She also holds a master degree in sports and health sciences from Exeter University, UK. Jyoti, we are really looking forward to hearing from the star. So over to you. Uh, hello and thank you for having me um, today. I'd just like to share my story. I mean, I'm not as experienced as a lot of people on the panel here. I'm only 30 years old, but I can tell you what I have learned um, in my limited time. Um, my first thing that I wanted to share with parents and students who are listening is that, you know, I often hear people saying, I often see a lot of young kids being pushed into certain fields and they're so young, which is great. Obviously they're getting a lot of extra years um, they sort of practice that um, and really become proficient at it. But I have to also point out here that I only started playing football at the age of 18. And I think a lot of people would look at me at that stage and say, well, you're too old to start a sudden, like start something at this age, especially sports. 
because I think sports, you always associate that with starting early and, you know, building up, playing under 14, under 11, under, you know, under 16, under 19, then going on. But from experience, my first sort of takeaway from this is if you have a dream, it's never too late. There's never a point where you say, oh, now I'm too old for this. So, um, you know, I, I missed my chance and I regret it, but I missed my chance. So given my own experience, I think that it's never too late to follow a dream. If you're really, really passionate about something, um, you can start at any point. Coming to passion, I think um, the most important thing about following a dream is really, really loving it. And in order to get to, you know, finding what you really love, it takes a lot of time. It's not like you hit that nail right at the start. Um, I have to talk about my childhood because uh, my dad's on the panel and I'm sure he knows this, but I had multiple, you know, days in my summer holidays or winter holidays where I would just be so bored. And it was not bored. It was just, there was no agenda. You know, nowadays, I see kids going to tuition and they have piano lessons and they have tennis lessons. They have no time to just be and to just be with themselves and reach this point where they come up with something that they want to do with their time. And growing up, I had so much time on my hands that I just, you know, wanted to try various things and uh, see if I enjoyed them. So I moved from, you know, uh, various things I would I started cooking at a certain point. I wanted to be a baker. I wanted to, uh, you know, be a really good cyclist. I wanted to, I just jumped from various sort of hobbies, you would call them, but also things that I would do in my, in my free time to just pass the time until I eventually hit upon football. And um, it was just, it just so happened that I enjoyed this a little more than I did the other things that I was doing in my free time. Um, and I think the timing of it is also important because along with passion, to pursue a certain dream of yours, I feel that it's very important to have a role model. Um, someone who is living that dream um, and you sort of look at this person, you say, wow, I want to be this person. I want to be like this person. And whatever this person did to get there, I want to do. So when you have time, you have passion, and you have a role model, I feel that's a winning combination to sort of start this dream. That's the start. I wouldn't say that. I would say that's chasing it. You haven't reached it yet. Because then starts the tough bit. Because then comes in the hard work. And uh, as Mr. Ismail already said, talent is just the start. That's only going to, you know, that's like a flint. About, over that, it's the hard work that really is the starting point. And for me, I have to admit, I wasn't, I'm not the most disciplined person or I wasn't a very hard worker. But I think my, my passion was just so strong that that sort of took me through the hard work. And if I wasn't as passionate, maybe I would have given up along the way. Uh, you know, it, it entailed early morning starts, entailed a lot of uncomfortable situations. Um, being in meeting new people who I didn't know, didn't necessarily like. Training to be a footballer is is not easy. You know, it's it's a lot of a lot of hard work, a lot of hours um, of training, and that's the really the part where you have to show grit and and push through, push through because you're so passionate about reaching that end point and about achieving your dream and about being, you know a little bit like your idol or your role model uh, who you picked in the start. So, I mean, along that way, when you, you have to work really hard and, and at the end of the day, I did become a footballer, um, which, you know, I have to say, I had, a, I had a lot of support. I think support and passion carried you through that hard work. So, you know, I had a family who supported me and um, for them, it was all about what I wanted to do, what I was happy doing. And um, I feel like kids today need that support from their parents, no matter what their goal may be. Uh, whether someone wants to, you know, just sort of open an animal shelter or become a tennis player or whatever it may be. I think a parent support or a teacher support 
or just someone out there rooting for you and saying, you know, carry on and you will do this um, is very important. Um, having said that, I have to say that um, a couple of teachers of mine in school also did help me along this way. And um, although I wasn't really, um, you wouldn't call me the leader in a group. I never really stood out. I was always part of a group. But they saw that when I was in a field that I felt comfortable in, say a sports field, or on, you know, when we were leading a team or something like that, that's where they saw my leadership qualities come to the forefront. And I think that's really good uh, teaching. That's, that's a really good skill for a teacher to have, to be able to um, observe a child and see where they are thriving. And to see that you need not necessarily be a leader, you know, in a classroom or in a science fair, but you're a leader on the field and that's a leader. It doesn't matter. So uh, a good teacher is one who can really see that in a child and help them to see it themselves. So I have to thank a lot of my teachers who saw that in me um, in school and of course my family who, uh, who didn't push me, but they always supported me uh, by coming and watching my games. And, you know, I always felt that, uh, me doing well in my sport was making them happy in a way. Uh, apart from that, you know, the truth of the matter is sport is not uh, a hugely uh, financial sort of um, department in this, in this country. And to be a female footballer playing football for a living is hard. Um, I, I don't think I would be able to sustain myself uh, financially if I had to live alone as I am. Uh, and just play football. Uh, at which stage, you know, I did have to do some thinking, but I was very sure that I did want to be in a field that involved either sport or exercise. And I, I was very clear about that. Um, and that's why I went on to, you know, study sports science. And now I can, I can train other people um, in terms of their physical fitness or even sport. Um, and also maybe help them achieve their dreams if it's in a department that I am good at. You know, if there are kids who are looking for uh, sort of training that maybe I didn't receive when I was that age. Um, and if I can help them in any way uh, achieve their dreams, I feel like I've done something in life. Um, I'll just sort of end with something that's always stood in my mind. Um, uh, you know, my aunt uh, is a psychologist and she often talks about the Ikigai, uh, which is the Japanese uh, sort of thing about what is your purpose in life and I often think uh, and this actually is the most it leaves me with uh, feeling the happiest you know uh, yeah I did achieve my dream I paid for India uh, but I think the thing that makes me the most happy every day I feel like when you achieve something it's, it's short term you have it you say two three days you're feeling great you're holding this trophy but then you know life carries on and no one really remembers. So at the end of the day, it's about you being happy, doing, you know, being you every day, every morning. And every morning, I feel I wake up and I ask myself those four questions uh, that the Ikigai asks you. Uh, one being, are you doing what is making you happy? My answer being yes. Number two, am I, am I passionate about what I'm doing? Yes, I am passionate about what I'm doing. Number three, am I doing something that I'm getting paid to do? Yes, in a way, my football, but also my personal training. As a trainer, I am getting paid to do something I enjoy doing. And number four, am I helping someone else by what I'm doing? And yes, I feel like through my, my personal training and being a trainer, I am helping other people, uh, you know, in some ways. So I feel football takes two of those things, me loving what I'm doing and me being good at what I'm doing. I think being a personal trainer helps me take three of those, actually four of those things. I really enjoy it. I am good at it. I am adding to the world in some way and I am being paid for it. So, you know, I can say at this stage, at the age of 30, I feel happy, I feel content, and I feel that in many ways, I am chasing a dream and I'm following it and I'm living it. Wonderful, Jyoti. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was absolutely wonderful. And uh, having worked with the Indian sports scenario for a brief period, 
I sincerely hope that football and especially women's football comes up in this country just as the other sports have. The last few years have been good for football, so let's keep our fingers crossed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, with that, we come to the end of our speaking session. Uh, we will move on to our question answer session. We have had questions that have come in through the course of this uh, session. We've had questions that were submitted to us earlier. Uh, an interesting anecdote. We started with Mr. Philip Barrett. We ended with Jyoti Barrett. The only other place where a father and child combination has been the opener and the closing has been Chris Broad and Stuart Broad from for England cricket. With that, we'll go on to the first question. Uh, Mr. Barrett, sir, if I can have you back for this answer. The question okay. asks, do you think teachers have a more objective and neutral view about a child dreams vis-a-vis -vis their parents? Okay, so am I audible for you? Yes, sir. So I I think that um, um, a teacher who's uh, who's extremely um, um, who's made connect with the students and a very very perceptive teacher, with a lot of acumen, a talented teacher, uh, who know a lot about a child that parents don't, know, and very often may not reveal aside him to parents that he would, would reveal to an outsider. And so sometimes I do feel that a teacher uh, is objective and helpful. Parents know children, but I am often surprised how little parents know their children. Um, and, and, you know, obviously a, a parent knows uh, uh, where a teacher doesn't. Um, and, and, a, and a parent might, uh, might look at, say, a, a, a career in sport as uh, being not very lucrative. So a parent might say, no, you don't go into sport because he's thinking far beyond. He's thinking of this child, let's say, in his 60s. Will the sport support him? Whereas a teacher being objective, he's not looking that far. He just says, this will make the kid happy. This will make the kid successful. So yes, I think a, a, a good teacher, there's, there's nothing to equal him. I think teachers can know more, more about kids than parents do. I hope that I... Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is for Brigadier Ishmael. Uh, if I may have you back, sir. The question asks... Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. The question asks, I understand that you have been a military trainer and a trainer even post that. Any small case study of helping someone achieve his or her dreams? Uh, the military trainer. All right. Um, now I can go back to my younger years when I was less of a formal trainer, though training is part and parcel of the professional responsibility of military leaders because military leaders are responsible for achieving missions. And those missions depend on the ability of each and every member of that subunit to not only do their own job, but also to be ready to take on the jobs of others who become casualties. And therefore, at a young age, um, I have read quite a bit about military history and, you know, uh, I'm an army family. And I always remember thinking that the one thing that stuck to me from my years of younger years of reading, even before I was in the army, was that the first casualty in battle is the plan. Which basically means that whatever you plan, when crisis hits, things always turn out slightly different. Because it's not possible to foresee all contingencies and you're often dealing with unforeseen things like weather, terrain, enemy over which you have no control whatsoever. So it led me to thinking that what is that one thing that can be predicted? And I thought 
that is the individual competence to perform under stress because our profession is one where when we are actually performing our mission you are often short of sleep you haven't slept for two or three nights you are scared you are tired you may be hungry you may be thirsty you may be trying to look as if you know what you are doing whereas actually you don't it's a very strange profession so personal resilience and i am from the infantry personal resilience counts big time so coming to your question of can you come to a case study when i joined uh, when i was a young officer in the company as a young company commander we were in jnk and we get vacancies on training courses which are essential not only for the competence levels within the unit but also for the professional advancement of individuals their performance on professional courses which are conducted at various places across the country we get vacancies now what i found was happening was that the vacancies would come and there would be a kind of a recommendation from the hierarchy of that company and i was a young officer five years service and would be that okay we'll send this chap we'll send this one we'll send this one and sometimes for good reason but what i found was that i often did not agree because i found there was a chap let's say going for a particular course who was who had been in that particular domain for 10 12 years but he didn't have the right attitude he'd been made say a machine gun number a member of the detachment he'd taken part in competitions he was known to everyone as he's uh, so and so but he didn't have the right attitude he was not willing to grow he was happy where he was whereas there was another chap who i noticed who was a young soldier who knew nothing about that particular weapon had never been put into that specialist detachment but he was an eager person he used to apply himself so assiduously to anything that he was given that sometimes you know it was almost amusing his brow would be furrowed he was almost like as if and i said no i said let's put this chap in not immediately but put him in while you are training we put him in as a along with the rest of them he went through one capsule he went through another capsule and finally when the vacancy came when we tested them he was the best and i asked him are you ready to go for the course he said yes i said okay i'm sure you will get an instructor grading now there's a grading on the course which is known as instructor grading that is you are fit you are so good that you are fit to be an instructor to be posted back to that institution and i was shocked at his answer standing there in front of me this young soldier says i will not only get an instructor grading i will bring back the best student award from the course i said okay well done good luck to you but in my heart of heart i thought the fit presumptuous the young soldier going from here is going to mau where there will be 250 hand picked people from across the army okay you do your best but to say that i'm going to bring back the best student award 6 weeks later kambadur ale came back with best student award in the day when i was drawing a salary of 2800 rupees a month i gave him a award of 500 rupees from my pocket for what he done he never looked back he went on to be an instructor he was sent on deputation to the crpf when they opened their jungle warfare school in the maoist areas about 8 9 year 10 years back he was sent on deputation there so this is one of many i was in ima dr savant sun was there and uh, she is maintaining a very
stern face. I'm not sure what feedback her son gave her. But um, her son was also a case of grit and determination. He broke, he broke a bone, was in trouble. I said, doesn't matter. Lose six months, it doesn't matter. A friend, mutual friend, spoke to me and asked me, what's going to happen? This boy, he's a good guy, this, that. I said, nothing going to happen. You go through the process again, he'll come out stronger, he'll come out tougher. He'll come out better. And today, he's a proud young officer in the Indian Army. So, I think talking about a small case study as a trainer, I think the trainer has to look at what is your ultimate mission. Like I said, it's not about teaching that particular weapon or that particular subject or that solving a theorem or trigonometry. Are we equipping that person to perform the mission that he or she will find themselves faced with? That's all I can offer from this. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Achin, the next one is for you. The question asks, you are an entrepreneur. What does it take to dream big? What does it take to be a job creator? I think very pertinent question for the current economic situation. So go for it. Thank you, Shubhai. Am I audible? Hello, Shubhai, am I audible? Yes, Arjun, go ahead. We can hear you. Uh, I think, uh, thanks for the question. See, first and foremost, uh, before answering this, see, I believe every, every profession or vocation is equally important. Nothing is big or small. All of us as stakeholders of the civil society have our own roles to play and we contribute in our own little way. But coming to entrepreneurship, since it's so close to my heart, few things that I would like to highlight first and foremost that it takes. To start with, most important is passion. Unlike what most people believe, money can't be the sole motivator. Unless until you love something, unless until something is really close to your heart, you can never put on, you can never put in those extra hours. You can never really go for it. So first and foremost, what I guess is most important is not to look at it like a day job. It has to be much more than that. And that again, I, I guess is true for, for, for most professions. People who really do well in their own respective fields, they don't look at it as a day job. Second, which I think is very important is self-belief. When you start off, 99% of people will say that you're wrong. You're mad. You're basically mad. So be prepared for it. Because they will not understand the kind of solutions that you want to offer to existing real life problems. Most of them will not even be aware about those problems. Now there cannot be any magic pill to it. It's only your self-belief which will keep you going. You can't be scared to lose. If, if you're somebody who's afraid to lose, if you're somebody who, who really want to hold on to what you have, I don't think entrepreneurship is the right choice for you. Before starting Notebook, I was working with the biggest consulting firm in the world. By God's grace, I had everything that one can aspire for at that particular age. And when, when I really chose to, to give it all, give it up what I have and embark on this journey, it was nothing but my passion. I really believed in what I'm doing and that was most important to me. Next, I guess, is flexibility. We really need to be flexible. It is very, see, all of us make mistakes, but the sooner we correct it, the lesser amount of egos we have. See, when you work in a team, it's very important that you listen to others. If it's a good advice, if you want to make course correction, go for it. Another very important thing, I think, as an entrepreneur, you always need to start with us and not me. You need to be somebody, see when you look at a particular person, when you interact with somebody, there are positive and negative aspects in each one of us, right? You need to be an eternal optimist. 
you need to be somebody who is a bank of positivity. When you interact with somebody, you need to see what is it in this, in this particular person which I can nurture. Everybody is equipped with some unique gift. Identify it, nurture it, use it to the best of mutual advantage. Next, which I believe is also very important is being a keen observer of life. Everything is important and all solutions are not there in textbooks. I completely agree with what the brigadier said. Even if you sit in the last bench of the class and, and students who really sit in the last bench of the class, at times they have a much larger worldview. They are the ones who really want to take the unconventional path. So I guess it's very important to, 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 to be a very keen observer of life. When we started off in this journey two and a half years back, I really remember that it was completely, completely new for us. And today, when in this last two years, I see more than five lakh students actively using notebook. It gives me a great sense of fulfillment. I'm happy that I'm able to contribute to so many lives. That is what really makes me wake up in the morning and come to work. The fact that we have been able to achieve more than 10,000 videos, so many people are using our platform, that kind of feedback mails we get, not only from metros, but even from remote corners of the country. See, financial, re financial returns can motivate you only till a point. Beyond that, it has to be socioeconomic return. It has to be something that you're passionate about, something which really makes you tick. I believe, Shubayu, that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Achin. Thank you so much. Uh, clearly, Brigadier Ismail's comments about the last venture found hooks in all of us because unfortunately at Notebook, we are a team of backbenchers who just decided to dream big one fine morning and created this. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is uh, for Savant Ma'am. Ma'am, if you're there. Yes, Subhayu. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question asks, competition also brings out the best. Don't you think people won't work hard to raise the bar unless there is healthy competition in any field? Considering the number of uh, candidates for any kind of an examination, be it a competitive exam or uh, uh, academic exam, the numbers are many. So to outshine and be in the top notch is extremely important for which you need to work very hard. Competition is required. That is when you'll be able to carve a niche for yourself in the field that you want to be a specialist in. Without competition, you will not even have the driving force to achieve what you want to achieve. And uh, Competition also creates that you stress. In psychology, we talk about distress and you stress. Distress is when you're driven to a point where you break down. And you stress is where it motivates you to achieve what you set yourself to achieve. So it's extremely important that competition is essential for one to achieve one's goal. I think I've answered it, Subayu. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah. I am sure the person who asked that question has also got the answer. Okay. We are running a little short on time, so we are going to hurry it up a little. We have yeah. two cases where the panelists have said that they would take the questions live. If I can ask Bharat sir to please come back for this one. Uh, there's a question, how to tackle a child who is quite obsessed with an impractical dream? Ah, uh, okay. So, Shabayu, um, I think this is the typical case where the child needs a bit of guidance and counseling. So, I use the time tested uh, acronym SMART. I think you all heard of SMART. So, SMART goals are very important, where S stands for specific, and M is measurable, and A is achievable, R is realistic, and T is time bound. So, in this case, this boy's case, maybe he wants to be a short cutter, 
he is only he only weighs about 52 kilos and his parents are small and short so i would slowly wean him away from his goal because i know it's going to come not and i put him onto something that sublimate drive of his because all i can see ahead of him is frustration and suffering and uh, that would lead to disaster so i think it's a good coach who sees a good coach and a mentor who sees that a dream sometimes is not going to be achieved and letting him go and you know hit himself against the wall is not the right thing and i think that's my answer in in brief way thank you sir i hope that answers the question for the person who asked that question as well we have uh one question that asked for Mrs. Nita Gangul is intro. Ma'am, if it is okay with you, can we connect the two of you on email? And then maybe you could share the details. Yes, definitely. I have no problem. You can share my details with anyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Brigadier Ishmael, uh, sir, please. Uh, the question yeah. about please being needed. Yeah, there's, uh, can you hear me? Yes, 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 please. Yeah, there's one question from somebody saying that uh, they like the example of children being praised for uh, their talent and for their effort. And the questioner asked that, but isn't it necessary to give praise also to motivate children? Uh, certainly, praise is required. The differentiation that you must remember is praising someone for talent they're actually not doing them a favor because they are already good at something. That is their comfort zone. The more you give, there's something uh, uh, called reinforcement. You know, the more you reinforce a person's comfort zone, the happier they, uh, they feel remaining there. Whereas growth and achievement, chasing your dream or any uh, thing like that depends on actually having the courage and the determination to step outside your comfort zone. And the moment you step outside your comfort zone, it will involve struggle. It will involve difficulty and it will involve rejection and disappointment. And this is where if a child has got used to being praised for effort, they're still being praised. You're still praising the child, but you're praising them for effort and not for talent. So a child who doesn't give up, who tries again and again, is praised for that. And not only the one who gets the right answer. So that's very important to build the growth mindset. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we just have time for one last question. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something very unfair. I have a question of my own. and I'm going to ask Jyoti that. Jyoti, if I can have you for this question. Given that you're father, Philip sir is also on this panel and he is our prized mentor at Notebook. On a lighter note, can I ask you for any instances that you want to share where you had a conflict with him after ch about chasing your dream? I'm, I'm taking things into the risky territory right now. <laughs> uh, okay, so you probably know my dad um, is an athlete, he used to be an athlete and uh, definitely into aesthetics. Uh, and the, I mean, I have to share with you that there are numerous times when I decided to play football or hockey or whatever other sport. My dad would be like, you know, athletics is a great sport. So, I mean, you know, it's in your, it's in your genes. Why don't you run the, the 800 meters, the 1500 meters? And I kept thinking, well, I'm not really a long distance runner. <laughs> um, I'm more of a sprinter and I like team games and that's more my sort of area and I remember my dad just trying to sort of like because athletics is great, long distance running is amazing. And but he never really pushed me into it, but I remember him asking me, I remember I am I asked him once, what event should I take part in in some athletic meeting? He's like fifteen hundred without even thinking for a second whether I would be good at hundred meters or fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred. I did that for two years and then finally I think he saw it. he said, you know, you may be a better sprinter, maybe shorter distance. You have that kick. So I'm so glad he um, he acknowledged that and he laughed about it even now. Wonderful story. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. We have more questions and we promise to get back to you over emails 
as much as we can. With this, let me call Ochin back for the vote of thanks. Ochin, if we can have you back, please. Sure. So I think it has been a it has been really a great session, and I thank uh, all of you for uh, being here with us today. But it's a great deliberation, and as I told you, it's very difficult to speak after you. But today your daughter did what I couldn't. She really stole the thunder. Jyoti, great articulation from your heart. I see lots of realism and honesty, and I'm sure a lot of our students will be motivated to to, to chase their dreams. Ms. Nita Ganguly, I really love your real life case studies. Very inspiring. It really inspires all of us. Dr. Savant, very aptly said, very elegant articulation to begin with, and very aptly said. We should really allow our children to dream rather than burdening them with our own conventional thought process. Not necessary that every child needs to be a doctor or an engineer or a chartered accountant. Let them pursue their dream, something that is close to their heart. I think very aptly said, really appreciate. Brigadier Ishmael, I love every word of what you said. In fact, when you were speaking, I was getting lot of, lots of WhatsApp messages. People really congratulating us. So both, so during this webinar, continuously we were receiving these messages. So I think we had a great session. I really thank all of you and even the audience for being here with us today. Take care, stay safe and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. We are closing the bridge for today. Thank you everybody for joining. Stay safe. Bye.